on episode 60 of Kennedy Financial. David Morgan brings it reaction and a whole lot more. Let's go. All right, we're back. Episode 60, John. The big 6-0. Today is June 30th, 2016. We, of course, have our guest, David Morgan, the original silver guru, coming on in just a few short moments, probably about six minutes, if you're unfamiliar with us here at Kennedy Financial. We like to open the show with a recent current event and then bring on our guest. So we'll have David on in about six minutes. But, uh, John, I have to admit, you know, it takes a big man to say when he's wrong, and uh, I feel Kennedy was wrong about Brexit. But as I always say on this show, you know, be wrong about things that you don't want to see. Like, for example, uh, I'm going to predict that Hillary Clinton is going to become our next president. And I also predicted the Fed would never raise interest rates. So predict things that you would prefer to see to go rather the other way, right? Right, right. Uh, I would say, uh, yeah, exactly. I, I went back and looked at uh, that, that clip where we talked about Brexit. Because I wanted to be sure whether I predicted that it would happen or not, and I did. I did the right thing. Uh, I went ahead and said I was not committal, and I didn't say anything. So that's really the best way to get ahead is just to make sure you don't make any hard and fast uh, predictions about anything. That way, you're always right. Wow. Well, good advice from John Kennedy. What uh, What other advice do you have for our audience? What was going through your mind as we woke up Friday morning to discover that the world was now somewhat a different place. Gold up over a hundred bucks at one point. Uh, the pound down what eleven percent, and uh, markets rattled all over the globe. What, what was your reaction? Um, I just concluded that this is a blip. Um, I mean, you know, it's easy to say that a few days after a lot of this has settled down, but it was unexpected, and that was the biggest problem with all of it. You know, to the markets. They, uh, they saw it and they, you know, they jumped and they said, this is not what we, we thought was going to happen. And so, uh, they hadn't had any, any days to really build into the price of, uh, you know, these market changes and market swings. Well, another thing that happened that was kind of surprising to me is that uh, a lot of people suddenly started weighing in about Brexit. Of course, <laughs> you and I it had been on our minds for at least a couple of weeks and, I, I take it back even further. I mean, I had heard the term Brexit a long time ago. I'm not exactly yeah. sure when. It didn't end up in our book, of course. Uh, we didn't know about it that long ago. But uh, I, def I certainly knew about it months ago, and it really was on our mind weeks ago because I think we talked about it on the show. So, you know, a lot of people started weighing in, people that don't normally care about uh, economics, finance, politics. And uh, I think maybe you had gotten a reaction on your Facebook feed uh, how did that go, and what did you? What happened to you? Yeah, so as you know, I'm a master troller on uh, online, and uh, I made a point immediately after uh, the news broke on Friday morning. You know, yeah, we had talked about this, and uh, I felt like I'm no expert on Brexit, and we, you know, we had talked about it a little bit, but um, we, it's definitely crossed our minds and and crossed our news sources, and uh, you know, we, I knew who Nigel Farage was. And uh, so, it, you know, it wasn't completely new to me. But uh, on Facebook, I posted a little tongue-in-cheek uh, trolling post along the lines of just saying, hey, millennials, I didn't realize, uh, you know, you were capable of doing it, but you were able to learn everything you needed to know about Brexit in the past uh, six hours since you woke up mm -hmm. on Friday. And uh, it was amazing, yeah, because... Dave Smith had a good point about this in his podcast. He said, you know, it's like if you're into UFC <laughs> and, you know, you talk about it all the time, you know, all the, the info, and you know about all the locks and who's good matchups. And, and then you have a buddy who's just like, I'm not really into UFC at all. Right. And, um, and yet all of a sudden when UFC, you know, 100 or 200 comes around, that guy all of a sudden has a lot of hot takes about right. UFC. And that's exactly, he, he 
you know, said exactly what I was thinking about this. And that's why I posted this. You know, I was just like that immediately you start hearing takes from people who are like, who know all about why a country needs to stay with the European union. You know, it would be a huge mistake and they have all these reasons why. And, uh, they, you know, they're doing their best not to sound like a verbatim Huff Poe article. And, <laughs> and of course the, um, w- Within moments of speaking about it, they're trotting out the R word, the, dread, the dreaded R word, mm. as you know. Well, uh, which which R word is that? Recession. It's it's it, racist. Oh gosh. Racist. So um, oh. yeah. So I'm hearing. I heard multiple people say say, uh, well, you know, there's a bunch of old people. They're all they're basically British Trump supporters, right? And they put it in these terms um, where they try and understand it and comprehend it and relate to it. On an on American basis, so now Boris Johnson, the former mayor of London, you know he's he's Trump because he's got blonde hair and mm. uh, and he's and he wants to you know get out of the EU. Never mind the fact that you know he's he's a British you know mm. politician. Thus, he's not even you know and, and Nigel Farage is one of the only people we might relate to, and uh, he's not even that you know libertarian. Um, he does use the term to describe some of their policies, though. Right. UK independence party. But, um, yeah, so it was just, it was just everybody jumping right back into their typical routine as it relates to politics, placing it in terms they can understand and not understanding it at all. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, we'll just go ahead and make that prediction now that, uh, when it comes time for the exit, you can be rest assured that the R word will most certainly be trotted oh, out without a doubt. Yeah. Especially, I just saw an article that came out on Zero Hedge saying that uh, the number of counties where whites are a minority have doubled since 1980, and a lot of those counties happen to lie along the Texas southern border. So just be rest assured, we called it here on June 30th, 2016, that uh, once Texas gets all their gold back and it's safely secured from the Fed back in the Texas Bullion Depository, then uh, we'll start hearing more about a Texit. But uh, John, before we go to the break, just a reminder that our show is carried on Silver Farm. Silver Farm does a great job of getting all the best audio on the internet into the ears of our audience. And uh, Kennedy Financial is proud to be carried on Silver Farm. We'll go to break, and when we come back, we'll have David Morgan, the original silver investor. Stay tuned. The economy's a mess, and you're broke. Learn to leverage this coming crash with my new book, Financial Judo, available on Amazon Kindle and free at my website, Philip with one L, Kennedy.com. All right, welcome back from the break. And as promised, our guest, David Morgan, founder of The Morgan Report and co-author of The Silver Manifesto. Thank you, David, for joining us here on Kennedy Financial. Phil, thank you. It's a pleasure to be on a new show always. Great. Well, you know, they say in life that timing is everything. We're very proud to have you here on our podcast and video here on this very special day. It's been five years. The last five years have been difficult for folks like us in our camp. But uh, let's face it, you know, even now Credit Suisse coming out and setting a silver target for the second half of this year at $18.75. But there's a problem because silver already hit that today. We're now at a 21-month high. So what's going on in your mind? Of course, our audience wants to know now that we're starting to see silver lead gold. Well, there's a lot going on. And you know, to specify exactly one thing, it'd be almost impossible. I've you know, been in this market basically for 40 years. Certainly, I wasn't uh, doing much trading during the 20-year bear market, but uh, I just put out a an update for website members. In fact, I'll probably do another one tonight after we finish our interview. And there is a key amount of silver on COMEX in the registered category. And once it gets below that threshold, every time something happens, which means that I alerted my people that look, uh, that we're here. We're at this level, and I expect something to take place. I think within two days, maybe three, we started to get this move that started yesterday, and today we got follow through. Uh, a lot of things on the commodity markets I could go through, but some of the basics is whenever you close on the high of the day, that's very bullish, and you usually get a carryover into the next day. The fact that we have confirmation in both the um, other white metals 
platinum and palladium have uh, moved significantly as well. And I think it's palladium has broken to the 250 and 20 day moving average. Uh, those that are thinking of swapping gold for platinum to get the ratio in their favor, which means platinum almost always trades at a premium to gold. It's 15 times rarer than gold. You might consider doing that if you're so inclined. It's a little bit of a tough trade, meaning that there's not a huge investment demand on platinum, but nonetheless, it is the noble metal. So a lot going on, and is it real or not? Certainly looks that way. Volumes have been good, and that's one of the key things to look at in any sector in a market, and that is if it's weak or strong is based on the volume. So if you have big moves up on big volume, that's significant. If you have a big move up on weak volume, that is a non sequitur. That really doesn't count. It's usually to fool the public. So this is uh, some pretty intimidating information for folks who may be new to the silver market. You know, here at Kennedy Financial, we're trying to target low income and at risk middle class families because we understand from Austrian economics that we're most certainly in a bubble and most of the public out there does not realize that. So in my book, I, of course, referenced the Silver Manifesto. I directed everyone to read it. And this book, you know, I tell people, you don't want to read it all in one sitting. You definitely want to take it in chunks because there's a lot of information to digest. So what, for someone who's new to the precious metals market, what would you tell them is the most important chapter or section that they should begin with so they can really start to grasp the importance of silver? Well, Philip, that's the one thing I would state is, you know, when you buy a book or any book really in the manifesto in particular, you do not have to read it cover to cover. You can, you know, pick and choose, you know, what sections you want to read. You don't have to read the whole book. I mean, there's a lot of people that, you know, are avid readers such as myself, and there's many books I've never read cover to cover. I, you know, pick out the fine points or the chapters that are most pertinent to what I want to look at. In, uh, in our book, The Silver Manifesto, I think the number one message is the utilization of silver. Silver is the most used commodity on the planet other than oil. Oil, of course, makes all kinds of plastics and, of course, fuel and all that. Silver, on the other hand, has all kinds of technological uses, jewelry, silverware, but uh, catalysts. There's so many things that silver is used for in the industrial base. And, of course, it has monetary history. Believe it or not, far superior to gold as far as being utilized more transactions by far than gold and being a monetary base more often than gold has, believe it or not. So that would be the main takeaway. I would say uh, if you really want to start on a silver book, you could get you know one off of Amazon, probably a buck or two, which is my first one, which is a primer, uh, which is called uh, Get the Skinny on Silver Investing. That's something you can read in probably an hour and a half. As far as the Silver Manifesto, this is for more serious students on economics, why there is silver manipulation, how it can be proved that there's silver manipulation, how to choose a mining company. And then the last chapter that I wrote was called Beyond Silver because there's so many issues that are coming to the fore. And you're one of the leaders now out there telling people what the truth is so that they not only can prepare financially, but more importantly, I think, prepare emotionally or at least with their attitude, because this is what's really going to take you through. It's not about money saving you. It's going to be more about how your attitude or how you would make these huge adjustments to what's coming in the next few years. So a lot of people have seen this video, Mark Dice out on the street offering a candy bar or a silver bar. I showed it to my wife recently and she was shocked, but that's because she lives with me. And ever since the financial crisis, I've been going on and on about the problems in the U.S. economy. So, you know, fortunately, my wife would probably take the silver bar, but you know full well that a majority of America, Americans, even now, as we're post-Brexit and we're starting to see cracks in the world economy, a lot of people would still take that chocolate bar. So... What indications will there be out in the marketplace when the man on the street is finally starting to figure it out? What's it going to take for the average American to realize the importance of this monetary metal? You know, I wish I had a you know, pat answer or an absolute, but I don't. I think it'll be just the further deterioration of the paper fiat scheme, what I call the paper paradigm, and it'll be an adjustment made by somebody that they know and trust. It'll be their neighbor that tells them, hey, you know, silver's on the move or you should buy some silver or something like that. People are so undereducated and I think somewhat it's deliberate. I mean, you do not hear anything out of the main financial channels talking about buying silver. There is occasionally, I mean, Monex may run an ad here and there, but uh, you will hear gold ads from time to time. 
time. And gold and silver pretty much track each other. It's an 85% correlation. But I really don't think that the average American will wake up before the inevitable top. What I mean by that is if we double the amount of people that are awake and aware and take action, which means they buy it physically. If that doubled from, let's say, less than 1% now to whopping 2%, that leaves 98% of the people saying, what the heck happened? I have a, one of my many sayings is there's three types of people in the world. Those that make things happen. Usually those are the people that take action. Those that watch things happen. Those are a lot of people on channels like yours and mine that really think this is kind of an entertainment scenario. It doesn't really matter. It's not really going to happen. Hmm. And those that wonder what the heck happened. And that's the vast majority. So when silver makes its big move, gold makes its big move, the bond market's crashing, a lot of people wake up after the fact. Another expression that I like to use is once the ship has sunk, everyone knows how it might have been saved. There'll be a lot of people, like 10% of the population, maybe even 20% of the population, that'll understand what happened in the silver market post-mortem, after it takes place. So one thing I like to do as a financial counselor is try to make gold and silver relatable. And the best way to do that is by comparing it to something that a lot of people own, and that's a house. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people don't own a house these days. I think we're at a 50-year low for home ownership, and that's because homes are way too expensive. Uh, so to uh, get an idea of where homes are sitting, back in 1980, when silver hit its close to $50 high, uh, you could buy a home for about, what was it, 2,000 ounces of silver. But by the time we hit the new millennium, when prices for homes were outrageous and silver had dropped considerably, it was 50,000 ounces. So now we're hovering around 20,000 ounces. For those who are stacking silver, when do you think it might be a good idea to actually spend their silver on what was formerly an overpriced home? Well, you just gave it. Obviously, it'd be like versus real estate or versus land. It could also be versus the uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average. It could be versus oil. There's a lot of things that you could uh, measure it against, other than a paper paradigm. Because to try to put a paper price on silver in a currency that can ultimately go to zero, not that the dollar will. I don't believe it will. But by the Federal Reserve's own admission, the 1913 dollar is worth about four cents right now. So now we're arguing over how much of that four cents is left and how long is it going to take to go from four cents to two cents. So I think your metric is really good. You know, what does an ounce of silver buy me? Is it undervalued, fair valued or overvalued relative to historic means? And you just gave the answer when you can buy, you know, a, a normal family home for 2000 ounces of silver, then it might be time to start thinking about buying a family home and taking your silver, you know, either cash it in and pay in fiat or just make a direct trade. Well, and since I have you on, you are the silver investor and this interview will be memorialized for all time. Do you think there could come a day when we could actually, with one 500 coin mint case, buy a median price home with silver? Yeah, I think it could happen this time. And I say it could, not would. Right. I want to choose my words carefully. I don't want anyone mad at me. I mean, I've been a maverick my whole life. And you know, I've been in the 1%, not the elite, but in the 1% of free market thinkers that are able to think on their own and question almost everything, especially authority. So uh, let's say there haven't been a lot in my camp, but the tribe is strong. People that are independent thinkers. None of them think exactly like me, and I don't want anyone to think exactly like me, but I do want them to think. So coming back to your question, I think that it will take place, and I think that we're going to see probably the biggest move in the precious metals that has ever gone on in all of recorded history. That's what I truly believe. So I'd like to get into one of my favorite topics, and that's the gold-silver ratio. I'll be honest with you and our audience here. I don't own a single ounce of gold, and that's because I still think whether it was at 30 to 1 or now at 70 to 1, silver's still been a bargain. So I just keep buying silver. It, all, it makes sense to me, and uh, I'll slowly convert someday. But you know, other than the ratio, what will you be looking for when that day finally comes? Well, first of all, let's go back to the, the silver-gold ratio and speak to the 70. I think 70 is a, a great breakout. In other words, once we get from 70 and lower, 69, 68, 60, 50, 40, 30, uh, this is a time around 70 where if you are overweighted gold or have no silver, you would want to swap gold into silver. And once you break that 70 level, it's probably going to accelerate. 
And then when would you want to swap back the other way? Of course, personal preference. That's a tough one. I mean, right now in modern times, looking at the last two decades or so, 35 has been about it. But if you look at my early work from the early 2000s, I said in this next you know, financial paradigm where things get uh, to a point where there's a mad run to gold, a mad run to silver, I think you could see what I call the monetary or classic ratio is 16 to 1. Or even the natural ratio, which is nine to one, I rounded it up to ten to one. So I think that's a point where you might consider, uh, you know, the possibility that silver reaches those kind of ratios. But there's ways to do it. In fact, David Smith, that's worked with me for years, he and I are writing a smaller book that's not quite as encompassing as a silver manifesto. And the premise of the whole book will basically be on how to exit uh, this market. Uh, at a profit and not too early. And that's quite a daunting task, believe me, especially in a commodity. But nonetheless, especially when it's so emotional, because when the fiat systems are failing all around, the emotional tide of the precious metals will be so great that it's going to be very, very tough for me to say, hey, it's time to take a look and sell silver. <laughs> People that love me now may hate me then because they will be so emotionally attached to it. But that day will come. So I think I would assume you have the same issue that I have. You believe in Austrian economics and you have extended family or acquaintances that you run into and it's only at holidays or at a cocktail party and you only have a short time to maybe bend someone's ear for a moment and offer them some reasons why you think we're in a financial bubble. And we have an uphill battle in this arena. People are bombarded with the mainstream business media and they've been led to believe that the Fed is in charge and everything is fine and all those problems from 2008 are ancient history. Brexit's not going to affect us. And there aren't any more pins out in the economy that could bring down the US dollar. So what kind of tools and techniques do you use to get these people, you know, convince them that there are problems in our economy? Well, the KISS method's actually pretty good in my view. I mean, it, KISS actually means keep it simple and sincere. I think you could sum it up. I like, you know, like a three-point type of presentation. One, all fiat currencies fail. Two, you cannot print wealth. And you could subset that with saying most people know about Zimbabwe. If you could print wealth, Zimbabwe would have been the richest nation on the planet. And three, we are in the greatest financial bubble in recorded history. So you've given them the premise that something that has been guaranteed 100% of the time up until now, it hasn't taken place, all fiat systems fail. Two, that the basic truth that you can't get something for nothing, which is what we teach our kids from a very early age, you've got to earn it, is how the whole system is sustained. They print money out of thin air to sustain something that's unsustainable. And three, you know, the third point really comes back to personal responsibility. You know, you have to take action for your own life and your own decisions. So that's it. I, I think those three are sufficient. If you over talk it or oversell it, and the best way really is you know, the Socratic method, you know, put on your Socrates hat instead of saying all fiat systems fail. You could ask the question, do you, do you know if all fiat systems fail? Like, oh, yeah, planted the seed. So I won't go on, I won't belabor it, but uh, that is my approach. With family, it's almost impossible. <clears throat> I mean, my sister is a believer, uh, my mother, and almost everybody uh, on that side of the family are not open minded enough. They are, and not in my view, I mean, I, I love them, but they are not uh, outside of the normalcy bias and the financial paradigm because they have, you know, financial planners and they have their TV set. And someone like me being a maverick and a free thinker thinks outside the box and knows a great deal of monetary history and wrote a book on it. Why would you pay any attention to someone like that? <laughs> well, frankly, hearing that, that the, the silver investor, the silver guru himself can't reach his own family helps the rest of us, you know, us mere mortals who have not nearly that much of experience so that we can accept the idea that some folks will be a lost cause and not to take it personal, just keep on going and, and spreading our message as best we can. 
So I have some listener questions for you. Uh, we had James Wesley Rawls on a few weeks ago. So our first question is from Tom, who asks, uh, he, you know, James Wesley Rawls happens to love junk silver. What's your opinion on what's known as junk silver? And what type of physical silver do you like the most? Well, I'll turn the question around. It really depends on what do you like the most, meaning the person that wrote the question or anybody in your listening audience. As far as junk silver, I think it's one of the better ones. Uh, there isn't a lot of junk silver, back silver, what I like to refer to as constitutional silver left. These are minted by the U.S. government, and they are dimes, quarters, halves that are 1964 or earlier. And they're very easy to recognize. They have very, if they're circulated, they have no, uh, you know, rare coin value, no numismatic value whatsoever. But the melt value is what, what it is. In other words, it's worth the amount of silver that's in that dime, that quarter, that half dollar. I think it's a great way to diversify. I like small units, especially if we ever got to a barter situation, not that necessarily we would. And we don't have to be in a barter situation for you to spend your silver into circulation. In other words, believe it or not, we're still free to contract with each other. So if you came to my house to buy my lawnmower and you said, you know, I'll give you this much fiat or I'll give you this many silver dimes, which one would you choose? I have the option or the freedom to say, I'll take the silver dimes. Thank you very much. So certainly that can take place. So I'm partial to the coins generally. Some people prefer modern day coins, which would be like U.S. Eagle or Canadian Maple Leafs or Australian series or maybe even the uh, ones that come out of Europe. I don't know. But uh, I like junk silver. But I also think that um, you know modern coins are probably worth having and silver rounds are your best bang for the buck if you go on the website and get on our free email list all i have to do is put in a first name and an email and we verify it we'll give you the 10 rules of silver investing and i go into more detail about that topic our next question is from bryant and this is a tough question i wouldn't want to have to answer it and uh, maybe you wouldn't like to either but let's face it you know a lot of people have believed that the silver market and gold market have been manipulated for quite some time. In fact, there's an organization called GATA that specializes in what's been taking place historically. So uh, Bryant asks, is this tsunami finally going to expose the COMEX paper frauds? Well, is it this tsunami or the next one? I don't know. In fact, it's funny he uses the word tsunami because David Smith and I, as I said, are writing this book. And we were going to call it the silver tsunami. I'm not sure we haven't really dialed in on the final title yet. But it could be. Uh, one of the key factors I mentioned at the start of your show is the amount of silver in the registered category on the COMEX at a level that we are currently witnessing. We've had two really strong days in a row. Two days don't make a market. but And we're getting confirmation the other white metals. I know I'm repeating myself, but I'm doing it for a reason. Because it could be this time. I don't know. I don't want to get anyone too excited. I know I have a lot of trust out there in the market. I don't want to lose my integrity or my, you know, my ability to have strong character. But it could be. Is it? I don't know. I need to see more data. I need to see what silver does above 19. I need to see if the volumes continue. I need to see what the commitment of traders do. And I also need to see what the exchange does. If they start raising margins right away, uh, there's lots of telltale signs that could take place that I'm well aware of that could dampen this market in a heartbeat. And believe me, they will do that. I know that for a fact. But as far as where are we, based on the physical amount of silver available, we are getting closer daily. So I have a mining stock question for you. It comes from John. John asks, how high do, do you think that Pan American silver or First Majestic silver could go? And what would you look for before bailing out of a trading account? Well, there's a couple things. What people don't realize, I'm sure your listeners do, but the general public, is first of all, how precious, precious metals are. Two, that a pure silver stock is almost an impossibility. Uh, one of the highest ratio silver stocks out there is First Majestic. I own it. Pan American is a good company. I own it. And where they could go, anyone knows. But let me give you a scenario that I wrote about in the Morgan Report not too long ago. In fact, I think it was last month. But once the physical market starts to dry up where you can't buy it in size, in other words, like the PSLV, Eric Sprott's physical silver trust comes in and they want to buy you know, 35 million ounces of silver, good luck. It's not going to be available. When those things take place, there will be a mad rush to buy anything silver or gold. Well, this is where the sovereign wealth funds, the managed money, the fund managers, uh, family trust, that type of thing, and the individual, of course, 
will be rushing into the next best thing, which will be the top tier cash rich unhedged mining companies, such as the two you named and others. And the amount of money, quote unquote money, the amount of fiat available versus the amount of silver stocks available, <laughs> it doesn't work. So you could actually see a Pan American act like a penny stock. In other words, you could see that stock potentially go up tenfold in a year. It happened in 1979. Hecla Mining started the year at $5 a share. It ended the year at $50 a share. It was the biggest trading stock on the New York Stock Exchange. It was the best performer in 1979. So if it can happen once, it can happen again. So I want people to understand that, you know, when I say something, certainly I have a strong opinion, but most of what I say is based on fact. Will it happen again? I don't know. I believe it will. And I believe it could be even better. Better meaning more meaningful or more significant than the last time. We have to remember the last time, the reason that the hunts were into silver was a couple fold. But it was basically a U.S. phenomenon. This time, it's a global phenomenon, which means we have a heck of a lot more people that will be interested in the precious metals than we had last time. Well, let's face it. The mining stocks are doing well this year. I think you tweeted out yesterday or the day before that uh, your best recommendation is already up over 300% for the year. So uh, we'll, we'll yeah. talk about how people can obtain your information uh, a little in a little while. We have uh, one more question from Jake. Jake asks, and <laughs> this is again, almost like a suitability question, but I'm sure you're going to have a great answer. How much silver should one person have? What's a good position? Should they have 100 ounces, 500 ounces, 1,000, or even more? Yeah, of course it's an individual answer, but let's think about it together for a moment. If you go back in time, and not that far back, there was a cartoon series called Another Day, Another Dollar. In fact, if you go into like the 1880s, if you made a dollar a day, we're talking a silver dollar a day, you were actually doing pretty darn well. If you made $2 in a day, you were doing very well. This is silver dollars. We're not talking these funny pieces of paper that we use now. So if we look at a dollar being worth a day's wages and we go into a state like mine where the minimum wage is about 10 bucks an hour, so I can do the math in my head, Eight hours is 80 bucks. So an ounce of silver would be 80 bucks. But a silver dollar is actually three quarters of an ounce. So actually, you're looking at an ounce being worth $100. I hope you figured the math. I could do it in my head. But a, a silver dollar is 0.77 fine ounce. So I'm going to round it down. So roughly, you're looking at $100 an ounce. That is the historic silver price. That's what it would buy you in the marketplace. So if you wanted to save six months, worth of savings, which is what most financial planners will tell you to do, then how many days are in six months? And that's what, 180. So say 200 ounces is probably enough because silver should, and I believe strongly, will get to that level, if not beyond it, when this thing really starts to unravel. So I would say as a minimum for most people, 200 is probably a good place to shoot for now, if we go back further in time and we look at the Daenerys, which was the circulating coin when the Roman Republic started, one tenth of an ounce of silver was a day's wage. So now you could theoretically take that dollar a day and move it down by, let's say, 10 times and 20 ounces would last you six months. Now, I don't think silver is going to that level, but what I am suggesting is it's far, far undervalued from historic means, and uh, 200 ounces is achievable for most people. When you get uh, into the discontinuities that we've seen over the last um, several decades, basically well before 1971, August 15th, when Nixon closed the gold window, because the distortions were already taking place, and Jack Ruff, the chief economist for De Gaulle, told him, these guys are lying. They're printing more than they actually have to back in gold, turn these green things into gold. And when France started to drain the gold pool in the United States, Nixon was basically forced to close the gold window, which is a breach of contract. And of course, this is when we started to live in the lie in an accelerated way, and it's only deteriorated from that point. There's a direct correlation between the moral structure of society and the moral structure of the financial system. They go hand in hand. 
the more lies from the on down, the more corrupt the system, the more there is malaise in the marketplace and the actual citizenry because the underlying, and it may even be at a subconscious level, is that, well, they're getting away with it, why can't I? So you have a complete deterioration and breakdown through all civil order. And this is what we're facing today throughout the globe. So we're not looking at particularly impressive times as far as the good fellowship of humanity uh, gathering together to, uh, let's say, um, stand in unison against the powers that be. They've used the best tactic in the world, divide and conquer. They've done nothing but point out our differences. It's too bad we don't understand. We all have a heart that pumps blood. We're all human beings. We have a right to be here. We don't need anyone to tell us what our rights are. They're inalienable. They're given to us by the creator. I believe it came from the primordial slime or from some higher power. I don't care. The point is that we are and we have intrinsic, inalienable, given rights because we are. But try to tell that to somebody today and you will get a look. And I've gotten several. But this is the truth. And the truth will win. Unfortunately, I think between that time and this time, we're going to see some huge dislocations, not only financially, but socially. Well, this has been highly informative. And like I said at the top of the show, a real honor to have you on because I think when we look back, and I could be wrong, my wife tells me I am wrong all the time. You know, I, I tried to catch the falling knife of silver in the 30s. But, uh, you know, I don't regret it because I think someday looking back, that price will still be low. And for, you know, those who are maybe just starting to dip their toe and learn about precious metals, don't be afraid. I still think this is a good time. So, uh, you know, again, thank you for coming on here on Kennedy Financial. How can folks continue to find your work and follow your service and even maybe subscribe? Well, I think the best thing is, uh, you know, I'm a pretty big hearted guy and to get something for free and I'll give you something very worthwhile. If you just go to the morganreport.com, there's a sign up box for our free report and our free weekly update on the right hand side. All we need is a first name and an email address. You will get the riches and resources report. And in that report, you'll get a film talking about the age of empire. We'll explain the big, big picture. And after that, there is a um, accumulation plan for silver or gold stackers that you can join and also get an affiliate link where you can actually be paid in silver and gold on a monthly basis just for telling your friends about the program uh, i actually know the people that started this and i'm a member myself it's really great for the average person that doesn't have a lot of money but it's a commitment it's a financial commitment to yourself where you put in i think the minimum is like 50 dollars a month that goes into a silver account it's the best way to buy a bull market it's just a dollar cost average try to keep the emotion out of it just keep stacking and i know there's a lot of people who do this so that's available in this free report and then uh, there's other uh, tips and ideas in that report. Uh, talks about uh, the leverage that you get through the mining shares and that type of thing. Uh, probably the best value out there is to buy the Silver Manifesto. You can go on Amazon. We've got some pretty high ratings. There's always some naysayers. I'm sure these are paid trolls that uh, you know have to say something negative, and that's fine. Let them say their make make their mark. But uh, and lastly, for those that are really serious, I do both trading and investing. I'm always 75% in the market. Sometimes I have a full commitment to the resources market. It's not just silver. We do all resources that make sense on a value basis. And certainly, believe it or not, there's more money to be made on the paper side than there is on the physical side. But most, a lot of people, that doesn't appeal to them. But as I said early on the show, Philip, There'll come a time where I believe there'll come a time where you, the physical market is so tight that people will be forced into the paper paradigm. In other words, off to buy mining equities or ETFs or options or something along those lines. And when that happens, uh, now you'll, you'll see these uh, other products that are already leaving the market. I mean, like you said, our number one pick for this year is up over 300 percent already. We're just getting warmed up. So. Lots of information. Just go to free. There's also a Twitter feed at SilverGuru22. There's a YouTube channel, SilverGuru. Uh, there's a Facebook corporate page. I don't even know. Just type in my name. You can probably find it. I'm on Google Plus and on LinkedIn. So if you want to find me, you can find me. Well, you've given us lots, lots of optimism for the second half of here in 2016 and beyond. But uh, David Morgan, silver expert, founder of The Morgan Report, and one of my personal heroes, thank you for coming on Kennedy Financial. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.
Well, all fiat currencies are destined for failure. Anything that's not any uh, piece of paper with a dead criminal printed on it that's printed up by a central bank, which no one knows who owns, that can print up as much money as they want, is always destined for failure. The U.S. dollar has been one of the best fiat currencies, uh, after the best fiat currency in the last few hundred years. Uh, it really started to go downhill, however, in 1913 with the founding of the Federal Reserve Act. Uh, that, and then they took the gold backing away from uh, the dollar in 1933 and actually confiscated gold from Americans in the land of the free. Uh, you don't read a lot about that in the history books. And then in 1971, the U.S. was so bankrupt uh, that they had to remove any last vestige of gold uh, from the dollar. So they did that on August 15, 1971 with Richard Nixon. Uh, he said it was going to be temporary, and I think actually it will be temporary. It's just lasted a lot longer than most people thought. Uh, but it's uh, a, the whole world went towards a fiat-based system at that point, and it's been that way ever since. All right, we're back. Another exclusive Kennedy Financial interview with none other than David Morgan. We're really proud and excited to have him here on our channel. John and I have both been fans of David for a long time now, at least since the financial crisis. I, I think... John, that's when I first got a clue. That's when I first picked up this book, Meltdown, by Tom Woods. Mm -hmm. And I realized that uh, we are really living in nothing more than a Ponzi scheme. And it's only gold and silver. They're going to be the last asset standing. Yeah, there's uh, so many times and situations throughout history where gold and silver have been the the you know foundation upon which anybody who made it out um you know how they made it out alive and uh so yeah th that would be the first thing um uh, you know i would think of and anybody who's got advice that's good and proven like david morgan would definitely be uh somebody i would go to first well he had a lot of knowledge that he shared with us and uh i'm sure most of our audience is pretty astute and probably knew most of the things that we covered, but we're getting brand new folks all the time. You know, people who maybe a week ago would have taken the chocolate bar over the silver bar. And now they're realizing, hey, you know, there's things going on. I'm hearing my buddy talk about Brexit. And uh, last week he was just worried about fantasy football. So maybe I need to learn a thing or two. But, uh, you know, silver, obviously in the news. I've got an article here uh, just from yesterday, June 29th. Unfortunately, I uh, didn't get anything from today. But it's from Market Watch, entitled Gold Settles Near Two-Year High, Silver Soars Nearly 3%. The rally for Silver Wednesday was more impressive than gold. The September contract gained 51.8 cents or 2.9% at $18.40 an ounce, with prices at their highest since mid-September of 2014. They got a quote from Marco Byrne. Mark said, silver is like gold on steroids when it gets going due to the very small size of the physical silver market versus stocks, bonds, and even the gold market. And uh, he's a research director at Gold Corp, which is based in Dublin. He went on to say, silver looks very bullish now, and our clients are allocating to it in a big way. I uh, recently unwound a uh, triple ETF, John, in uh, the USLV. Unfortunately, I bought it a little bit too early, so it didn't pay off as nicely as I hoped. But mm. I think I'm convinced that we're climbing a wall of worry. This we're going to see a lot of volatility, but we you know, I could be wrong. I've been wrong on Brexit, I've been wrong on interest rates, but on this I'm more convinced that we've seen the bottom it happened in January. And since we're climbing a wall of worry, you can be rest assured, okay, if we get a big run up in uh gold and silver, then I can bet uh, I can short the market with a, an ETF and uh, get out of that and then immediately in my long positions be continuing to build a position and uh, seeing big gains in the months and years to come. What do you think? Yeah, you know, the um, this this situation we're in with Brexit, I think all of a sudden people are, are concerned, you know, and they, they have they had a lot of reasons to be worried before and uh, yet. Now, all of a sudden, there's a good excuse, you know, and so a lot of the talking heads are going to start talking about, well, you know, we didn't know, uh, we didn't know that Brexit was going to happen. So we didn't think about that in terms of our portfolios and, and uh, you know, our, our, what, where our stocks are going to be going. And uh, now, of course, well, everybody saw it coming, you know, and everybody. So, yeah, I would, uh, I'm definitely interested in, in looking uh, on Wednesday, you know, at the pop in silver sort of catching up with gold too, you know, because um, 
we've seen gold pop a lot recently uh, after Brexit, and uh, it didn't see quite the same movement in silver. So um, I'd be definitely looking to uh, normally, you know, when we see uh, gold and silver move, silver is much more um, volatile. You know, it'll it, it might go up a lot more than gold, but it might uh, drop a lot more than gold too. Right. Yeah, it was pretty interesting. You know, I put out, I tweeted out a picture uh, I, using someone's uh, advertising materials. You know, after gold popped a hundred bucks after Brexit, I said, "Hey, this is change we can believe in," and I uh, put a gold eagle there in place of a, its previous symbol. But uh, <laughs> you know, while gold was up a hundred bucks, you would think, "Well, gosh, silver would be up at least what? I don't know, two bucks," and it was up maybe eighty cents. So it wasn't even a hundred to one. Um, I think silver still has a tremendous way to go, as we covered with David Morgan, the original silver guru. And just stay patient, keep building a position. You know, that's what we've been doing since even 2011, buying all the way down and now buying all the way back up again. You know, none, none of us knows where the tops and bottoms are. Anyone who tells you that is just lying to you. So be patient and stay the course and uh, believe that real money is going to win the day. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, keep watching shows like this so you can uh, keep listening to people that support, you know, buying bullion, you know, because otherwise, who else is going to tell you uh, to stay the course, you know, and, and keep a steady hand? You know, otherwise, you got a bunch of people who are uh, talking about, oh, well, you know, after, uh, you know, Brexit, now it's time to invest in Great Britain or something, you know, or uh, right. some, you know, there's always some brilliant guy who's got a, a million ideas. And um, yeah, you know, it certainly, it's, uh, it, it's refreshing to see a country uh, do something where it's not all based on your your typical you know reaction. And uh, so the movement in the stocks, I think, uh, you know, part of me wants to see uh, stocks go up just to say, hey, everything's fine. You know, mm. um, it, there was no need to worry. Um, but then also to see stocks go down and, and gold, silver go up like that uh, definitely caught my eye. You know, right. Well. I think that um, really that this this is our time now. I've been we listened to all the experts. We've been thinking about this for a very long time, and the last four to five years have been really rough on folks who believe in real money. And I think that your average investor is starting to get it. I mean, the fact that some of these gold funds are up a hundred percent this year speaks volumes, and I think. Folks are going to begin to ask their broker, hey, why am I not? Why don't I have any exposure to gold and silver? So it's not going to take much. I think, you know, as Dave Kranzler said or Rick Rule has said on this show, you know, like less than 1% of investors have any exposure to the precious metals market. Uh, and imagine if it got up to the 1980 levels of 6, 7, or 8%. You can imagine what these prices are going to look like. Yeah. The, uh, you know, and there's all these guys who obviously have been doing this much longer than we have, and uh, so you could see where they have a, uh, a more calm approach to things. You know, I, I, Dave was talking about, hey, you know, he's not he's not entirely sure whether in the short term, uh, you know, gold is going to go up or, or you know, it might have a little downside here, but in the long term, you know, he's 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 net positive, and uh, so. You know, it's. I think it's refreshing also to hear just uh, someone talk about, hey, yeah, you know, it doesn't always go up. You know, and you hear a lot of investor advice that goes the other way, and they'll say, no, you can't lose. You know, T Ty J Young, you know, <laughs> we only go up, we never go down. Right. You know, uh, I got a bald head and a business suit, so I prove it. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as as we've always said on the show, anybody. It tells you something like that, steer clear, because they're lying or delusional. Well, I think we should wrap up now, John. Is there anything you want to say before we close and uh, wait for next week to figure out what uh, I got wrong this time? <laughs> uh, no. Well, you know, just that uh, I'm, I might be starting a little side project on uh, johnrobertkennedy.com so we can see that website get a little more traffic, mm -hmm. you know, because currently it's uh, it's a bit of a, a uh, little wild, wild west, you know, tumbleweeds blowing mm -hmm. through there. So, um, yeah. So keep stay on the lookout for that. Okay. Well, we won't get uh, ahead of ourselves with that. We'll wait until that project is ready before it's a uh, world tour, you know, a, a world premiere. 
But uh, in the meantime, if you have any questions, uh, be on the lookout. Email us at phil at philip with one l kennedy dot com. Uh, I'm not sure who our guest is going to be next week, but as we've said before, we've got a couple good ones chambered. It's just a matter of working out their schedules, and it's a little bit difficult in the summertime. So stay tuned to the Kennedy Financial Facebook page or Twitter feed, and we'll put it out there. But uh, until next week, after the 4th of July and Independence Day, see you then.